Well, good morning, everyone. I'm hoping some people will join us. I'm just going to take a few minutes to let you do that. It's um, great to have you here with me this Sunday morning. As you join live, please do say hello so I can say hello back and uh, we can begin our Bible study in a few minutes. And we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through to 18 this morning. So if you want to get a Bible and find that, then that would be great. I'm aware that people will join us in a few minutes, so I will wait until that happens. I'm hoping that this uh, network connection isn't too bad and that we're able to get things going. That's better. Um, so looking forward to you joining me. Um, I'm hoping people will come live on stream in a moment or two. There we are. There's, who's that that's just joined us? There'll be others that will join us again, I'm sure. But I know someone's just uh, come online. Say good morning to me. That would be really wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, and the numbers are beginning to jump up, which is really great. Lovely to have you here. Um, who's, who's online with us and where are you from? I'll just take a cup of coffee. This is the benefit of being able to share together on a Sunday morning like this. We can be slightly more relaxed, although I'm dressed for church because I will be leaving here to go to go um, to Dundonald immediately after this service, this uh, little session of teaching. Morning, Ruth. It's lovely to have you uh, with us. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. Really appreciate it. I see our numbers are jumping up already. Good morning, Tracy. Great to have you. Who else is here? Good morning, Gary. Um, oh, from Newry, hope you and Alison are having a lovely weekend. Uh, good morning, Doris, down in Cork. It's great to have you and your family with us. Uh, good morning, Maggie. Good morning, Margaret Johnson. Elaine McAvoy. It's great to have you all um, from all the various places. Linda, thanks for taking the time to be with me. Brian and Jean, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Nicola Doherty, it's great to have you. Kate Allen, really wonderful to have you with us too. Thank you. Good morning, Colin. Uh, Harrogate just made it. Well, we're not quite started yet, so we'll be started in a moment or two. So I was at the Elam conference this week. It went really well. I'm glad to be back in Dundonald, feeling as if I want to get into my stride, really, as ministry begins here. Thank you for your continued prayers for us. We really do appreciate it. It's so kind of you. I don't know if any of you watched the royal wedding yesterday. Lots of people are talking about the impact of the preacher and whether he was... Um, good or bad, it sounds like he was a bit of a marmite preacher for many people. Um, but it was wonderful to hear scripture read and it was wonderful to hear the principles of love expounded and people encouraged to bed their lives in that. And we know, of course, as Christians, that that love is only possible through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and what God has secured for us on the cross. It's uh, really wonderful to have all of you as we continue to explore the book of Philippians. I love the fact that we jump up to 100, 120 people during this uh, little podcast. And we're going to read the Bible together. It's 8.32, so we're running a little bit late this morning. My apologies for that. We should be done in the next 15 or 20 minutes or so. So if you have a Bible, uh, then we're going to read from Philippians chapter 2. And we're going to read from verses 12 to 18. But I want to pray first, so do join me in prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for every person who's joining online from wherever they are, from across Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, from across the United Kingdom and beyond. I know that this podcast is listened to by people all over the world. Thank you for the four and a half thousand people or so that are joining it each week. And I pray that as we turn to your word now, that you would speak to us, that you would give us wisdom and clarity and a sense of your purpose speaking into our hearts and into our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would keep us attentive to your spirit. And in this day uh, that we need to be work out what it looks like to be faithful, I pray that you would help us to do the right thing, to live according to your plan and according to your purpose and according to your way. And I pray that you'd open our hearts and open our eyes. You know the people that are watching online now and those that will watch online this week. Some of them um, not churched, some of them disappointed in church, some of them pressing into you, some of them getting ready to go to church. Thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. And I pray that your people will be fed and strengthened today by Holy Scripture in all that they are and in all that they do. In Jesus' name, Amen. So let's read together. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 2. As you know, I, knew, I read from the New Revised Standard Version. And we'll be reading from verse 12 down to verse 18. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence... But much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. 
For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me. God always blesses the public reading of his inspired and his infallible word. So we come to verses 12 to 18 of Philippians chapter 2. And as I've said over the the weeks, we now turn our thoughts a little bit to Paul's example. Remember, so far in chapter 2, Paul has been saying that he wants those that are listening or hearing these words being read to them to imitate Christ. He'll go on to ask them to imitate Timothy and Epaphroditus. But he also wants them to imitate his faith in some way. And in this passage, from verses 12 through to 18, Paul encourages them to live clear, godly, pure lives in the midst of what he describes as a perverse and a crooked generation. Those are words that are really unpopular with uh, 21st century Europeans. We don't like to hear words that challenge us. We don't like to hear words that remind us of the darkness that surrounds us. I want to go to verse 12 to um, lodge what I think I'd like to share with you today for you to think about across this week. And it is that very simple little word, therefore. Paul has just made a huge point of lifting up the example of Jesus in his, in his humility and in his suffering and in his obedience. And he then turns his attention to the Philippians and he says, because Christ has lived faithfully, you can lay down your lives. You can live like a light shining in the universe because Christ has been faithful through to, to us. We can be faithful to him. And I love the tone of verse 12. My beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but my, now much more in my absence. There's a, a real sense of encouragement and exhortation here. Paul isn't saying, now you are all useless people and you've got to listen to me. Instead, he's saying, I want to encourage you in the good work that you've done and I want you to keep going. As a pastor, I think Paul has this brilliant knack of encouraging people. He doesn't lambast them. Even when he says some of the most difficult, hard, um, dynamic things that rock you to the core. He challenges the Galatians about legalism. He challenges the Romans about division. He challenges the Ephesians to be faithful. He challenges the Corinthians about sexual sin and spiritual hyperbole. And he challenges the Thessalonians about being lazy in the light of the second coming and getting their doctrine all wrong. And yet he always lodges it in addressing them as brothers and sisters and telling them that he loves them and celebrating what they're doing well. Wouldn't our churches be better if we did that too? Not lambasting people every time we get behind a pulpit, but reminding them of our love for them and God's love for them and God's purpose for them and his encouragement of them. And Paul says to these people in the uh, city of Philippi, I know that you've been seeking to be faithful. Press into that. Press in. That applies to you and me too. You know, we make mistakes. We fall, we falter, we get it wrong. I've made mistakes in the last few days. I make mistakes all the time, as do you. But we need to learn also to celebrate that we're still here, that we're still pressing into God, encouraging one another to press in to all that God has for us. Paul has left Philippi and he says to them, I once was with you, now in my absence I'm asking you to press in. That's a hint. None of us can live out somebody else's Christian life. We can encourage them, we can inspire them, but we can't always be with them. We're not always there. There's only one person who is always there, and it's God himself by the power of the Holy Spirit. And he sees you today. The other people that are encouraging you are praying for you. They know about you. They're praying for you, but God sees you. God is with us. He's right present in my study here in Carnlock. He's there in Newry with Gary and Alison uh, Gibson. He's in Cork with Doris Sinnott. He's in Harrogate with Colin Burke. He's in um, Belfast in Dundonald uh, with uh, Eddie Lenny. He's always faithful. He's there. 
He knows what you're going through. He knows what you're facing. And he's able to carry you through it, just like he's able to carry me through it. He also knows the church that you're part of. And Paul goes on here to say, um, just as in my presence now and my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's not an individual command or instruction. It's a command to a group of people. And Paul says to these people, work out what it means to be the community of faith together. But do so with fear and with trembling. If you want to put it another way, do so with a real sense of the holiness and the powerfulness of God. Remember that he is present. Um, every church has to work out what it looks like to be a faithful Christian witness. Dundonald Elam um, are trying to do that just now as we enter a new phase. We're seeing great blessing and many things happening. But we need to work out what it means for us to be faithful in this season. As do you, wherever you are, again from Harrogate to Cork, wherever you find yourself, what does it look like to live in faithful witness? I guess there's a challenge to that because the circumstances around us change. Our culture changes, but the gospel doesn't change. So we need to take the gospel as our anchor. We need to take God's character, God's presence, God's instruction as our anchor and tether ourselves to that and then live faithfully in the light of that gospel. Listen to the next part of the verse. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure in verse 13. In other words, Paul says, take this seriously. Take seriously what it looks like to be a follower. Take seriously what it looks like to be faithful and take seriously what it looks like to share the faith because it is God who is at work in you. And he uses two phrases, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In other words, God is at work in your intentions, in your desires, in your attitudes, in your decisions, in your priorities. And he is at work in you working that out. Sometimes we find ourselves as Christians having to say no to something. The world around us will sometimes accuse us, and I think rightly, that we have become more known for what we stand against than what we stand for. But the reality is this. Sometimes in the immediate we have to say no because we're saying yes to a bigger, better thing in the future. So in sexual ethics, we say no to immediate gratification of our desires because we're saying yes to a better future. With money, we say no to just being driven by it and it turning into an idol in our lives because we're saying yes to a better future. And here is, every time you say no to something, every time you choose not to engage in something, remember that you're saying yes to a better future. The idols around us will try to get us to give them everything. There's a little phrase that is sometimes used about an idol. It promises you anything, gives you nothing and takes everything. Um, an idol will sex, power, money, wealth, career, uh, popularity, Instagram numbers, uh, Facebook followers. They all promise you anything um, so that they can get your attention and they can get the centre of your heart. Your family will promise you anything to get your attention and have the very centre of your heart. But it delivers nothing. Idols deliver nothing. And in the end, they take everything. That's the insidious nature of them. Paul says the person that you need to live for most faithfully is God himself. And remember, in our decisions and in our actions, God is at work. Today, on the 20th of May, I don't have to make all my decisions on my own. God is at work in me. His spirit lives in me. He will guide me and help me. And as I make decisions, sometimes saying yes to things, sometimes things, saying no to things, I'm making those decisions because of the better future that God has promised. So I want my life in the present to conform to the future that God has already given me. And therefore, I have to make choices. I have to confront sin. I have to confront it in me as a pastor. I sometimes have to confront it in other people. As a fellow Christian, I have to sometimes talk things through with people where relationships have gone wrong. It's not because I'm being difficult. It's not because I'm being awkward. It's not because I'm being hard. It's because I believe that both for that person and for me, there's a better future. And we need to address those issues that divide us now so that we can step into it. And Paul goes on to say in this, these verses, this is a powerful witness to the world. 
in verse 14, verse 15 and verse 16, he encourages them to avoid quarrelsome talk, to avoid arguing, to remember that God is at work in them and to hold out for holiness and for God's purpose and plan in their lives. Listen to verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and arguing. Very simple. That's to live our lives in unity. Now, let me pause here because unity is often cliched and made into a magnolia promise in Christian speak. It's, we almost suggest that we're never allowed to disagree. We're never allowed to talk things through. We're never allowed to have two different perspectives. Yesterday, I had a conversation with somebody and I disagreed with them. It wasn't heated. It wasn't difficult. I think it was a bit awkward. But that's only because we're not used to honest dialogue. We run away from it. Paul says, in your conduct, in your conversation, do all things without murmuring and arguing. We can disagree without arguing. We can have a conversation where we have two different perspectives without arguing. Arguing is to tell other people that they're always right, wrong, and you're always right. It's to, it's, it's to be so driven by desire and, and, and animosity and, and, and the negative energy that can um, hang around us that we're not able to have honest dialogue. I want to be able to have an honest dialogue. And I want to suggest to you that actually one of the reasons that many churches end up feeling like unhealthy places is because people are afraid to confront issues of disagreement. We don't know how to disagree well. We don't know how to talk things through. Marriages end up becoming silos where people decide to live benign, separate lives because they don't have the courage to have honest conversations. We don't need to murmur. We don't need to mumble. We don't need to gossip. We don't need to grumble. We don't need to fight with each other. We don't need to fall out. But if those things are true, how do you talk? Well, you talk honestly and openly. In the words of Ephesians 4, we speak the truth in love, but we do so with an attitude of desire to maintain the unity of the body and the bond of peace. So we do all things without murmuring and without arguing. And here, listen to this, I love this. So that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. So Paul says, avoid murmuring and arguing, not in some kind of stark, dictatorial, Victorian, finger-wagging schoolmaster way. He says, Avoid them so that you can be pure and blameless, so that you can enjoy the holiness that God has for you. Live this way so that you can enjoy life this way. Avoid arguing and murmuring so that you can enter into all that God has for you, so that your habits can form holiness in you. Your habits can open the door to the holiness that God has for you. That's really cool, I think. It's not so much, oh, I'm not allowed to. That's a bad and nasty thing, although that's true. More it is, I will choose to live differently because I want to live hopefully and I want to live in a holy way. And I want holiness to pervade who I am and I want grace and mercy to be at the centre of who I am. And therefore, I'm going to reject murmuring. I'm going to reject gossip. I'm going to reject pulling people down. I'm going to reject being dishonest about my feelings. I'm not going to pretend everything is okay when it isn't. I'm not going to live as if I'm some kind of porcelain saint. Paul encourages them in, in, into authentic community, into real, living and genuine community, so that they can shine like stars in the universe in a perverse and a crooked generation. I think that's a really challenging phrase, but I have to say that with all the beauty of modern Europe, with all the beauty of the world in which I live, it is still a perverse and crooked generation. We still see millions of people suffering when they shouldn't. The idols of self and money and power and human resourcefulness are still all around us. Um, I'm going to say something that many people will disagree with. The royal wedding was fantastic yesterday. But my goodness, it was not only was it a celebration of love, for those of you that um, like weddings and I love them, it was also a celebration of human endeavour and not so much a celebration of God's endeavour. I love the fact that uh, Bishop Michael Curry rooted what he said in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. I'm going to be talking about that um, a little later on at 11 o'clock in Dundonald. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind and your strength and love your neighbour as yourself. Our love isn't rooted in our resourcefulness. It's not rooted in our goodness. It's not rooted in our purity. It's rooted in God and his grace and his mercy and his life and his energy and his passion and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. 
And I'm telling you, if the folk at the royal wedding yesterday looked uncomfortable with what Michael Curry was saying, imagine how more uncomfortable it would have been had he talked about the cross and what Jesus has done for us and his grace and his mercy and his love. Today, I want to encourage you to root your life in the right soil. You live in a generation that doesn't know God, but partly because nobody has told them, and also would reject the grace and mercy of God because it, to accept Christ involves rejecting our own self-reliance. And the greatest idol of our age is that we are the centre of the universe. We get to decide what's right and wrong. We get to decide who's in and who's out. We get to decide who's holy and who's not. Our lives revolve around us. And there can be no greater idolatry than letting a society's life revolve around what it determines to be good rather than what God determines to be good. In a few days, in the Republic of Ireland, you guys are going to be making decisions about Article 8 of your constitution and the impact it has on abortion. Whether that article is carried or not, I want to say this to those of you in the Republic of Ireland. Um, do the right thing. Um, stand up for both um, mums and those children that are yet to be born. And whether you win that referendum or not, and I pray you win it, whether you win it or not, Remember this, what God defines as good is more important than what our society has defined as good. And in our churches here in Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, we need to remember that what the Bible defines as goodness is, is always right. And what society defines as goodness is not always right. And we've got to learn what it is to live in holiness and faithfulness in the midst of a world which is perverse and crooked. That doesn't mean that it's dark and demonic and everything is terrible. It simply means this, that its centre is no longer God. And when we take God out of the centre, there is a rush of other things, none of them as pure and holy and kind and generous as God, to fill that vacuum. Our church in Dundonald, the town of Dundonald, the greater area of Belfast, Northern Ireland as a nation, the Republic of Ireland as a nation, the island of Ireland, the continent of Europe, we have allowed God to go to the edge and we revolve goodness around us. That's what Paul says is wrong in Philippi. We are to shine as a community centred on Jesus and on who he is and on what he wants. And then he says this in verse 16, it is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in labour or in vain. It is not how we start this race that is the most important thing. It is how we finish it. Paul is using a phrase when he says shining like stars in the universe from Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. And it says there that those who lead others to righteousness shine like stars in the universe. What's your plumb line today? What's my plumb line? The plumb line that we have, the thing that we measure everything against is given to us in verse 16. It is the word of life. We hold fast to the word of life. And you and I as Christians know what that word of life is, not by our own ingenuity, but because God has given us the scriptures that point to his son, the living word, the Lord Jesus. This written word is the shaper of us under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And it points us to the living word. And there we find hope and life and grace and mercy. Paul uh, reminds us of that. And in another book in the New Testament, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews describes the word of God as a living, active, two-edged sword that is able to join and to separate us and to pierce us to the very centre of our being. We live according to the scriptures, not because we worship the Bible, but because we, we believe they've been given to us by God and they shape us in all matters of faith and doctrine and practice. And they're reliable and trustworthy and they bring life and hope and grace and mercy. And when the world sees us living differently, they will be impacted by that. Paul finishes this little section of his letter by reminding them that he is being poured out as a libation offering over the sacrifice of their faith. Now, let me explain that. Libation is um, a term used to describe the pouring of water or oil or, or wine sometimes over a heap of offering that's been left on an altar, on a table or on the floor. And Paul says, what is being offered to God, hear this from a pastor's heart, is the life and the faith of those that he has pastored. And he's pouring his life as a libation offering over 
the lives of the saints that he is presenting before Almighty God. That's a beautiful, beautiful picture, isn't it? Here's what a pastor wants. Here's what I want for the congregation that I lead and the congregations that I have led previously. I want them to finish well. I want them to get to the point where their life is presented to God as a libation. And, and I want to pour my life over their lives as a libation offering. I want them to get to the end of their journey and see that they have made it, that they have been perfected, that God has been at work in them. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you also must be glad and rejoice with me, Paul says. God's at work in my life. Those that I've pastored have also impacted me hugely. They've prayed for me. They love me. They support me. Many of them are listening to this podcast right now. We're in this thing together. So as you go about your business today, take advantage of all the wonderful things that were said yesterday by Bishop Michael Curry. The language of love and the language of hope and possibility. But do what he couldn't do. Push further into it and point to the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Point to a never-ending source that will never run out. Take the passion and the energy and the love and the faith that that man had and the courage that he demonstrated in front of billions of people and press into it and encourage people that you see today to press into the love of God and let it flow through them and out of them to other people and let that same love shape you too. May God richly bless you. Hold fast to the word of life, brother and sister. Live pure and blameless lives and shine out. Avoid murmuring. Avoid gossip. Avoid negative talk. Avoid pulling people down. Speak honestly and graciously and lovingly and rest in what almighty God is doing in your heart, in your will and in your actions. And may you be richly, richly blessed. I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you for all the people that are joining us now from so many different places. Will you pour out your spirit and life upon them? I pray for the guys in the Republic of Ireland who are faced with this enormous decision. Would you give them grace and strength? I pray, Father, that you would guard over that whole process. I pray for the men and women of Northern Ireland and the men and women of the United Kingdom and the men and women of Europe and those around the world in the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and everywhere else that will listen to this podcast. May they know your deep grace, your deep mercy, and may they be encouraged into the wonderful things that you have for them. As many of them go on to church services today, I pray that you would use them as a blessing and as an encouragement. May they go with expectation and hope in their hearts. Thank you for your grace, your mercy and your love with us always. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please do share this uh, little teaching on your Facebook page or your Twitter page. Let people know that they can join us. It'd be great to continue to build this little uh, community. It's such a wonderful thing. I enjoy it immensely. And I'm really grateful to you for taking the time to be with me. Have a great week and God bless you all. Thanks very much. <laughs>